All right. So today we will be talking about the, I named it the Brain Death Odyssey. Um, so we'll be talking a lot about the concept of brain death, how it started, what was the time frame, why was it conceptualized, and where it has led us to. It is something in neurosciences we do all the time, but I feel that we should know exactly what was the niche of it, what was the crux of it, and where it has led us to. So it's a journey, and that's why I named it Odyssey. Uh, the picture which you can see is by Mr. Philip Chamberlain in 1600s. The tulip at that time resonated as life, skull as death, and our gloss speaks for itself. It is the time between life and death. Let's start the Odyssey. So before we start into that, let's go into the Black Laws Dictionary, which was being used at that time. And 1951 is pretty prominent, and we'll talk further about it. Why was it prominent? So in that dictionary, which was also being used in the courts for the cases, death was defined as a cessation of life, the ceasing to exist, defined by physicians as a total stoppage of the circulation of the blood and cessation of the animal and vital functions consequent, thereupon such as respiration, pulsation, etc. So it was a very broad definition. There was not a pinpoint um, point to it that where it has to be determined that, hey, this is it, that has happened. It, it was just a stoppage of the circulation. So today's Grand Rounds will be discussing the criteria for determining death, which has varied widely across cultures and historical periods. Understanding the diverse ways in which death is defined and understood across cultures can provide the complexity of this universal human experience. There's a quote that there's only two certain things in life. It's tax and death, and we all know these are inevitable. So the learning objectives are brain death history, understanding the death across religions, defining brain death, discuss its diagnosis, explore the ethical implications, and highlight the controversies which has surrounded this concept over the years. And the learning outcome will be the brain death criteria itself. So as we all try to manage and we also provide holistic medicine medicine it's very important to know the crux of this uh, experience and what it means to others i do not have any disclosures so i named it to whom may does death concern to and it's important because i feel whenever we step inside a room to do brain death exam it's important that what are the other people expecting out of it and what will happen next because the exam itself is five to seven minutes. And after that, you are closing thousands of thoughts, th like decades of years. So we'll talk further about that. This is a very interesting picture. It's from medieval age in which a um, person is on the deathbed and the demons itself are distracting him from the, the council of angels. So we'll define some death across religions. Um, in Christianity, Christian believes the concept of an afterlife. Islam, Muslims do believe in the concept of afterlife. The soul continues to exist. In Judaism, it's a little more complex. It's, it's on specific denomination. Hinduism believes in reincarnation, the soul being reborn into a new body after physical death. Buddhism also believes in reincarnation, but reborn into a new body after, after physical death. But there are also indigenous religions, the tribes which believes in that and own practices. Some believe in the spirit world and afterlife. We have to respect all of them, and it's important the way we do it and we talk to them, we have to keep these in our mind. Death across cultures also varies. Some cultures see it as a natural part of life. It is viewed as a great tragedy. Many believe in afterlife. Funeral rituals often involve a service by burial or cremation. The mourning period can last for weeks, and black is a universal symbol for uh, mourning and tragedy. But there are some cultures who also feel that this is actually a celebration of a person's life, rather than mourning their own de the death. There may be a period of mourning, but there are festivities behind it as well. We have to keep this in mind and not always have one bias whenever we go into a room. So 
this is a big slide, but it is the brief history of interventions. And what I want you guys to take out of the slide is 1947 to 1968. A lot of interesting things happened in that area. And I feel 1947 to 1968 was when I would term the resuscitation and organ transplantation era. Between the, these years, the death concept changed, prolongation of life changed. Why it happened? Because ventilator was made in that era. Uh, there was close chest massages. Religious point of view, Pope Pius XII came in. He issued a statement about prolong prolongation of life. And then the brain death criteria, actually, it was created in that time as well, which we'll talk further. So 1947 to 1968, the era is the prolongation of life era. So, coma de pass or beyond coma is a very interesting phenomena that has led to what we have today. Let's go back from the top of the history. In 1947, Claude Beck performed the first successful defibrillation of a human heart, and death was reversible. There was no concept of human heart dying before, and defibrillation happened, then you come back to life. In 1950, Bauer and Bennett developed the first positive pressure ventilation, and questions arose regarding prognostication and withholding such measures were debated as unethical due to medical advancement. In 1954, Dr. Robert Schwab from a National Hospital questioned regarding a patient with no brainstem reflexes and flat EEG, that is this patient really alive or dead? Ventilator was turned off and the patient passed away. The idea came in that if a patient does not have brainstem reflexes and have a flat EEG, but circulation is there, is the patient really alive or dead? In 1959, French scientists Mollerat and Goulon named such scenario coma de pass or beyond coma. But they kind of disagreed with Robert Schwab at that time. They said, well, even the person is in such coma, we will call it as a beyond coma because we don't think that is death. We think that's a prognostication for death, as most patients passed away with cardiac arrest days later. So there was a lot of debate between 1954 till 1968, and a lot of debate was on these two concepts. That is really comma a prognostication, or it is death. So in 1957, Historically, the church was also being used uh, regarding death and prognostication in somewhat. I feel Pope Pius XII was very monumental because he was the first one from a religious standpoint of view that they said the moment of death is a moment when irreparable and overwhelming brain da damage occurs. It's not within the competence of the church to determine this. And he, he tried to put a boundary to it. And he put that the church view is that a time should come when resuscitative efforts should stop and death should be unopposed. So he received a lot of criticism from medical communities, philosophical communities, and even from the churches himself. But he had vision. So the first, what would we say, the death tri triad was by Dr. Schwab, who we actually talked about with Mollard and Goulon. Uh, that what exactly he meant, he, what he tried to say is, well, the patient does not have brainstem reflexes. He has a flat EG. How can he live further? And when Mollerat and Goulon from France disagreed to him, he, in 1963, after a couple of years, gave the first triad of brain death. It was basic, um, and he said that, well, you should have fixed and dilated pupils, no elicitable reflexes, no spontaneous movements. The patient should have apnea and isoelectric EEG. And those who meet this criteria should be considered dead in spite of cardiac action. He worked further five years um, and accumulated 90 patients, and he used this criteria for, and none survived, and all had extensive necrosis of brain tissue. This in the history was the first time when brain was called the center organ, not the heart itself, which had been happening for 
thousands of years since maybe the perception of humankind. So you can see the build up, how things have been being built up. You have the ventilators coming in, you have resuscitation efforts coming in, the church coming in, and now the great genius Schwab comes in, and even Moderate and Gulan had a lot of build up to it as well. So why we needed this definition at that point? Advances in intensive care and life support technology had made it possible to keep the patients alive despite severe brain damage. However, there was no consensus on how to determine when actually these patients had truly died. It's a dilemma that patients were just stuck on the ventilators for days and days and nobody knew if they were really dead or not. Um, and at the same time, the organ transplantation, that movement had already started as we discussed before. So the concept of brain death is a medical diagnosis and it is very recent. Prior to the mid-20th century, death was only defined by typically cessation of breathing and heartbeat. So in the later 1960s, physicians and medical ethicists began to advocate for a new definition of death. The concept of brain death came into being. It was extremely controversial at that time. There are like articles, philosophers writing about it, opposing it. But they took a big leap in 1968. An ad hoc committee at Harvard Med School published a report that proposed a definition of brain death. And it included reflexes, absence of reflexes, without mechanical assistance, breathing, and the absence of any electrical activity in the brain. So they wanted multifaceted, multi-speciality ad hoc committee to come into being, and Beecher and Murray constituted this committee. They had three neurologists, which was Dr. Schwab, which we talked about, Raymond Adams, Brown, and a neurosurgeon, a nephrologist with an attorney, a neuroscientist, physiologist, a professor of public health, and a historian and ethicist. So you can see they tried to gather every um, part of the society that they could, so when they produce the whole formation, there will be less criticism, or it's more agreeable to. So this is the ad hoc committee of the Harvard Med School, the Beecher Report, as we call it. Great visionary people, and it's not that it was the committee formed this report in a day or two. There was a lot of back and forth. There was a lot of debate between each other, and some of the reports were also uh, released in press, and that also showed that there was a monumental report coming, but there was a storm also coming in medical community um, and even in religious communities as well. So this is the historic paper that came out of it on August 5, 1968, a definition of irreversible coma. This was the report of the ad hoc committee of the Harvard Med School uh, to examine the definition of the brain death. It was in JAMA, and um, it's open. You can all read it. It's an excellent paper. It's a five-page paper, more than that. So the, what's the definition of irreversible coma? In 1968, it came then unreceptivity and unresponsivity, number one. There's total unawareness to externally applied stimuli and inner need and complete unresponsiveness. The second was... No movements of breathing. Observations covering a period of at least one hour by physicians is adequate to satisfy the criteria of no spontaneous muscular movements or spontaneous respiration or response to stimuli. It included all the sensory stimuli, pain, touch, sound, or light. And then they talked about the reflexes. The pupil will be fixed, dilated, and will not respond to a direct source of bright light. Ocular movement, which we have ocular reflex and blinking are absent. There is no evidence of postural activity, decerebrate or other. This is an important point which was debated further as well. And then swallowing, yawning and vocalization are in abeyance. Corneal and pharyngeal reflexes are absent, tendon reflexes are absent. And then they also outlined a special electrode system uh, which will help to know if the EEG is flat or not. So these were the four points which defined the irreversible coma. All of tests should be repeated at least 24 hours later with no change. 
and exclusion of hypothermia should be there, which is temperature below 32.2 Celsius or CNS depressants such as barbiturates was necessary. But they did not highlight that how, if there are depressants, how long they have to be in the system or not, what is the half-life for them. And then decisions should be taken by the physician in charge in consultation with one or more physicians who have been directly involved in the case. So why to use the definition of irreversible coma as the new criterion for death? An individual whose heart continues to beat but whose brain is irreversibly damaged, the burden is great on patients who suffer permanent loss of intellect on their families. Again, the holistic view of medicine came into being that if a person is on the deathbed, is on the ventilator, but his brainstem reflexes are not working, his brain has suffered permanent damage and intellect, the families will be in hope and they will continue to use these resources. And I think this still happens a lot with us. Um, and a lot has to do with the ventilators and also with the anest anesthetics which we give because we cannot determine the brain there. And those in need of hospital beds already occupied by these comatose patients. Um, also, the second important point was that the obsolete criteria for the definition can lead to controversies in uh, obtaining organs for transplantation. After this, uh, sorry. Yeah. So, the Beecher at all at that time then presented an argument. They said that well, it was after 1968. That those times, the heart was considered to be the central organ of the body. It is not surprising that its failure marked the onset of death. But there, this is no longer valid when modern resuscitative and supportive measures are used. These improved activities can now restore life as judged by the ancient standards of persistent respiration and continuing heartbeat. So what was exactly the criteria which came out to be? And we are using somewhat of the same criteria abolition of all posture reflexes, including decerebrate postures, complete paralysis of respiration, widely dilated fixed pupils, paralysis of ocular movements, swallowing, phonation, face and tongue muscles, all paralyzed. There could be involvement of the spinal cord, which has always been a big debate, but it could be less constant and reflected usually in um, loss of tendon reflex or all flexor withdrawal or nociceptive reflexes. And of the brainstem spinal mechanisms, which are conserved for a time, the vasomotor, ref vasomotor reflexes are the most persistent, and they are responsible in part for the paradoxical state of retained cardiovascular function. And this is important concept because we have to remember these are independent of the nervous control, especially in widespread disorder of cerebral brainstem and spinal cord. So after 1968, um, there were multiple criteria which came into being. There was the Harvard criteria, which we talked about, but then there was a Minnesota criteria. Excuse me, somebody's mic is on. Um, so somebody can double check kindly. And then the Minnesota criteria came in, which was in 1971. The change was that the spontaneous respirations would be checked for at least four minutes at a time. And they only wanted the absence of brainstem reflexes. The second came the United Kingdom criteria in 1976. And they wanted to establish the etiology first, exclude mimeting con conditions, and there should be absent motor response. Not all the reflexes, just the absent motor response. And then the last and the final would be the absent brainstem reflexes. So Howard criteria said no reflexes at all, but now there was more evolution to it. There was debate on the reflexes that they can come in or not. And then in 1981, the President's Commissions came in and they introduced for the first time the apnea. The apnea with PCO2 greater than 60 and absence of posturing. This was also monumental because then the apnea test came into being. So this is the 1995 AN determining brain death policy. Uh, this was huge because the American Academy of Neurology then weighed in. 
they made a summary statement they produced a special article um, in the 45th edition and they further talked about how we need to have a uniformity in decision making how we need to have uniformity in the apnea test and the diagnosis was almost being made as per their documents almost 25 to 30 times a year in one of the large referral hospitals and the justification was that again we have all the resuscitative measures we have organ transplantation but how long can we continue to have the same patient on the same bed when other patients are coming in 25 to 30 per year was a large number if you see a patient is staying on the same bed for months Today, um, brain death is widely accepted universally. It is important to note that brain death is a legal and medical definition again, and it does only apply to cessation of brain function. There has been a lot of questions if circulation stops right with the brain death. No, the heart has not to be stopped with brain death. The first European country to adopt the brain death as a legal definition was Finland in 1971, while in the United States, the Kansas had enacted a similar law earlier before 1971. So what is the pathophysiology of brain death? It's basically the abrupt loss of cerebral perfusion um, if there is concomitant elevation of intracranial pressure more than what is the mean arterial pressure. The definition, as you all practice, is CPP equals to MAP minus ICP. And it can happen due to extracranial lesions. It can happen due to intracranial lesions. Hemorrhage, uh, traumatic brain injuries, falls are all one of the major criteria which have happened in the U.S. Um, from our standpoint of view, when we go inside the room and we have to determine brain death, I think these spinal reflexes and movements are very important to know. And most important, I think, is Lazarus sign. So the Lazarus sign comes from uh, St. Lazarus from Bible, who was reincarnated by Jesus. Basically, patient, if there is suction, there is checking of reflexes, hands will go up, come across, and then slowly go down. Um, families believe the patient is getting reincarnated, or families also believe that the patient is alive. But what we need to know is that this is a spinal reflex which was elicited by head flexion or sternal stimulation. Myoclonus can happen again. It's a bad prognostication marker. And then triple flexion reflex, which we almost see all the time, is the flexion of thigh, leg, and foot triggered by the plantar tactile stimulation. Interestingly, even since 1968, the variability between brain death criteria is, I would say, if I dare, it's humongous. It has varied throughout the countries. It has varied throughout the cultures. There was the biggest study which was happened in 2020, which had 136 countries corresponding, which is almost 42% or I may say 50% of the world, revealed high variability. 83 countries had brain death protocols, and while 53 did not even have any protocol, 83 countries with protocols, out of them, most of them had unique protocols. This study also determined a considerable difference between clinical exam of the components of the brain death examination. Every sub criteria had something different going on in between them. For example, the pupillary reflex is in 90% of the 83 countries, but then corneal reflex was like 87%. Ocular vestibular reflex was in 67 countries. Gag reflex in 62. Um, Oculocephalic reflex we talked about 58. And then, interestingly, <laughs> that all other reflex which was part of the criteria were only in 22 countries. So they all were mostly checking brainstem reflexes, but only certain parts of brainstem reflexes. Apnea test was a big requirement in most of the country, but the target of apnea test changed in almost all the countries, what the PSCO2 will be, and it really varied according to the institutions. Another study done in 91 countries by Patel PV so 22% of low-income versus 97% of high-income countries had a policy. And again, it had to do with the organ transplantation, that those networks which had the organ transplantation had a uniform protocol. 
but those countries who had low income countries where there was not a lot of deed given to organ transplantation, they did not even have a protocol to name brain death. So one of the recent studies which was done in top 50 neurology and neurosurgery institutions as reported in 2006 showed variability in apnea and cell retesting. It was found that there were different requirements for the examiner depending on the state, including if one or two physicians are required to determine brain death. Some states like Alaska um, allowed nurses to assess brain death with further certification by a physician. And another common requirement is that the patient is the potential, if the patient is the potential uh, organ uh, donor and the physician is a part of the team which will procure the organ, he cannot determine the brain death, which also made sense. The so brain death who performs is a big debate and it's really on the necessity. I'm going to just talk briefly about our hospital's brain death performance, that who can perform it. Uh, since neurology and neurosurgery gets called all the time, I do not know if I could publish uh, it on the presentation. But our policy in University of Louisville was um, revised in 2020, and it categorically st states that, that brain death can be performed by neurology, neurosurgery, and trauma team. But it does not say that if each team should have one member, which implies that the same team can have two members as well. So it has to be two members. And one of the member should be a PGY2 or above. The other member has to be PGY4, which could be a chief resident, an attending, or a fellow. So one member has to be PGY2 or above. The other member has to be above PGY4. And it could be from the same team. However, our hospital policy does not tell about MICU, the ICU team. It only allows in Jewish hospital and Mary and Elizabeth hospital, which um, I don't know why, but MICU cannot do as per the, our hospital policy. The next is something that was uh, recently published, the World Brain Death Project. The minimum criteria needed to determine the brain death by performing a literature search, which happened between 1992 and 2020. And this was actually published in Continuum, which we will talk further. And they tried to concise all the information in one criteria. And the reason was, as I told you, there was so much variability in diagnosis at that time in the world that was going on that every institution, state has its own criteria, which was kind of absurd because there was no uniformity of if this patient is really brain dead or not. So for all the residents, um, this is an important part that what are the prerequisites for the brain death criteria? Before you go into the room, you should first check all these labs. The evidence of etiology of coma should be known. And then confounding conditions should be excluded which could be severe metabolic, endocrinological, and acid-based derangements. Some of this information is figurative, but some of it has lab values, which we have to keep in mind. If there is a drug intoxication, which could be from our side as well from sedatives, five half-lives of the drug clearance should be weighted with adjustment to renal and hepatic functions. Core body temperature should be greater than 36 degrees for 24 to 72 hours. And warming blankets are optional, and there is no harm in using warming blankets to use uh, to get the temperature above 36 degrees. Systolic blood pressure should be greater than 100, and it can be achieved by the vasopressors or vasopressin. In our hospital policy, systolic blood pressure has to be reached above 90. Thorium should be between 110 to 160. Osmolarity should be less than 350. Calcium should be less than 12. Uh, glucose should be between 70 to 300. pH should be greater than 7.2 and alcohol should be less than 80. Now the dilemma or the quandary comes in when you are using anesthetics like barbiturates, you're using pentobarb um, or phenobarb, then the half-life is pretty prolonged and then the prerequisites do not meet up. So we'll talk further that if prerequisites do not meet up, 
than if we can go to ancillary testing. Another prerequisite is that if a certain period of time has passed since the onset of the brain death, to exclude the possibility of recovery, usually several hours, one neurological examination should be sufficient to pronounce the brain death. Legally, all physicians are allowed to determine brain death in most states, but neurologists, neurosurgeons, and ICU specialists have specialized expertise, and this is what our hospital also mentions. So the three parts of brain death exam are brainstem reflexes, apnea testing, and ancillary testing. Ancillary testing is required mostly if clinical examination cannot be fully performed or apnea test is, is inclusive or has state hospital organ donation guidelines. Remember one thing that whenever you go to the brain death exam, before you, organ donation, um, the association has already been called. And like University of Louisville, Organ Donation Association CODA has been called when the GCS is five or less and brain death is imminent or has been assumed that it will happen. So Organ Donation Association might come before you. So for reflexes, loss of pupillary light reflex, people should be mid-sized between four to nine or dilated and not reactive to light. A magnifying glass can be used, a pupillometer can be used to further assess. We have used pupillometer several times. It really helps to know exactly uh, what's the, the size of the pupils. And then one thing that uh, a lot of medical students and res residents, we all have trouble is, is oculocephalic reflex. What is oculocephalic reflex? It's for four, five, um, four, six, and eight. So think of it this way, that you are the head, if you put it like this, and if you move, your if your head is going to the left, your eyes should move to the right. But what happens in dolls is that they do not move like this. In dolls, the eyes and the head move in the same way. The eyes should move the opposite to what the head is moving. But at the same time, it is imperative that you have to make sure the cervical column is stable. Cervical spine is stable, and there are no cervical spine precautions. If it is a C collar, you cannot do that. So I use this picture since it's a uh, the question which always arises. So if you see, I don't know if it's Charlie Chaplin or not, but uh, the normal positive would be the opposite side, and the absent would be that it's moving or stagnant in the same side as it is. Then we have five and seven loss of corneal. You can put a cotton swab on it. Loss of eight, which is the next question which a lot of people ask is about ocular vestibular reflex, caloric reflex. The prerequisite is the head should be elevated at 30 degrees. Each external quadrant canal is irrigated one year at a time with approximately 50 ml of ice water. And movement of ice should be absent during one minute of observation. Uh, both sides should be tested. Then there's loss of gag reflex by bilateral procedure, pharyngeal membranes, and loss of uh, cough reflex by tracheal suctioning. Um, your catheter can go to up to the mark of the cornea and followed by two, one to two suction passes. This is a good example of ocular, uh, ocular reflexes in conscious patients. If you see the cold water when going in, there will be a slow phase on the side of the cold water and then there will be a fast phase. This is the normal ocular reflex. But if the brain step is only intact, there will be only slow phases. And if there is no brainstem intact, you will see it will be pretty much constant. There will be no eye movements. Everything will be stagnant. Apnea testing. Um, something which I feel we do not, uh, we practice, but there are prerequisites that need to be met thoroughly. So why we do apnea testing? It is the ability to provide pulmonary function uh, it is the ability to see if brain has the capacity to drive the pulmonary function and what's the response to the carbon dioxide. So firstly, we have the PSCO2 between 35 to 45 and partial pressure of oxygen within the, air, the arterial blood, which we checked, should be above 200. And then we can use PEEP up for 5 to 8 centimeter of water. Oxygen cannula is then connected to the endotracheal tube at 6 liters, a TP is at 12 liters, and then the CPAP pressure should be between 5 to 10 centimeters. Um, ABG has to be checked after 8 to 10 minutes after doing the buff. And if the PCO2 is 
sixty or above, or there's a rise of CO two by more than twenty above baseline, then it is consistent with brain death. I'll tell you that we had an incident when everything going was going towards brain death, but when we rechecked the POCP CO two at that time, the rise was not above twenty, and the PCO two was not above sixty. So we had to actually cancel the brain death exam at that time and call it inconclusive because of this criteria. Um, and then CODA had to get the ancillary testing to confirm it. With advancement, we have ECMO machines. And for ECMO machines, oxygenation can be maintained while performing the apnea test by decreasing the gas sweep flow rate to 0.5 to 1 liter per minute. And then you can also use uh, oxygenation through the endotracheal tube. Ancillary tests, which are which used pretty much all the time now, but in tertiary care centers, we have the privilege to have cerebral angiography and uh, SPECT science scan. So cerebral angiography, four vessel, is the gold standard for evaluating cerebral flow. If there's no cerebral flow, we can say that this is the, brain, the person is brain dead. Transcranial ultrasound, I haven't really used in my practice so far, but it can assess cerebral, middle cerebral arteries and basilar cerebral arteries. Uh, and then CTA, MR, so cessation of cerebral blood flow, and then spec span can further tell us. Now the question is about EEG. Um, EEG has to have a special electrode system, uh, which can further sell the electric cerebral inactivity. We won't go further into that. So there is some EEG variability. Um, although in the United States, a flat EEG is not required to certify, but in England, it is not even considered a test. And in the code of practice criteria, EEG is not uh, used because it might not reveal in parts of the brain, above the brain stem where might, there might be activity. So now there are updated guidelines of uh, brain death. There have been updated guidelines on the temperature, and there have been three major guidelines, 2010 and then there was 2011 Society of Critical Care Medicine, American Academy of Pediatrics, and Child Neurology Society. And then the World Brain Death Project, which we talked about, um, was published in Continuum. We practiced 2010 American Academy of Neurology guidelines, and I think most in America, AN guidelines are being used. World Brain Death Project was basically, as I said, 1992 to 2020, all the data across 27 countries and five medical associations uh, accepted that, that this should be used. Um, one other thing, the, the change was the component number of examiners. In AN, we only need one. 2011, Critical Care Society needed two. The other thing was the observation. In AN, the observation between examinations was not stated. 2011 did state it should be 12 hours. And then in the World Brain Project, if two examiners had done it, uh, then observation is not necessary. The rest of the exam was pretty much the same. Third thing was the apnea. Uh, World Pro Brain Project said that the apnea test should be one in adults and two in pediatric patients. Society also said to two, but we follow the AN guidelines, and for us, one is enough. Most of other guidelines about apnea tests pretty much remain the same, which is the PSCO2 above 60, and then um, a rise of 20 above baseline is enough as well. Coming to the end, I think um, these are six good quotations which AN proposed for communication to the families that if you have to communicate to families, what should be the wording exactly? Because it is a tough point that how you should word that patient has died or passed away. So I think this is a good picture. You can take a screenshot as well. Most of us um, use that there is, this is a devastating and non-recoverable brain injury incompatible with the return of consciousness. Or I wish there was something that we could do, but unfortunately recovering from death by brainstem criteria is not really possible. I also co-authored a brain death criteria book chapter a year ago. I used this as a reference as well. Um, and I also wrote a poem on that brain death criteria. 
a year or two ago, which was published here as well. And uh, thank you for listening and watching me. I like Woody Allen's quote that I'm not afraid of death. I just don't want to be there when it happens. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thanks, Yusuf. Really good job. All righty. Thank you, Yusuf. Uh, the patient that had the uh, the CO2 had not gone up enough. Yep. That, that that means that you jumped the gun, that you checked the, the second blood gas was checked too early. And it, that's always difficult to say when to check the, blood the gas. second blood gas to see if it's gone up enough. Because if you wait to, if you wait, don't wait long enough, that happens. If you wait too long, then <clears throat> the heart goes into some arrhythmia and then it's definitely aborted. But if, if you check it and it's not high, while you're waiting for that result to come back, your, the, the test continues. And right. as long as they're not going into an arrhythmia, you keep, you keep, okay. the, keep the apnea going and then, uh, and then you ask the respiratory therapist or someone to, to get another blood gas and another after a minute or two minutes, depending on how close you were, but that's always a challenge is to, to figure out how long should you wait. Right. And in that, uh, in that instance, actually Koda called the guns and they went for cerebral angiography because they had to harvest organs and they didn't want to wait further. Um, and I think a lot of shots are called by Koda here as well. They kind of guide us further, but I totally agree with you. Yeah. Well, the, the the brain flow study is when it is abnormal, it is definitive. And the yeah. apnea study, if you give someone enough drugs, you could you could make them fail an apnea test. That's what happens when people come in, they overdose, and they come in because they've had too many too much narcotic in their system. So so the but the brain flow study is definitive. Once there's no once the, the, that that's when the cerebral pressure, intracranial pressure is higher than the arterial pressure, and, and then the perfusion is zero. Yeah. So that's that's definitive. But thank you. That was uh, it was a nice review. Historical. Sorry. <laughs> Excellent. All right, guys. I used all these ref references. And I appreciate you having me. Thank you.